Muy buenos días a todos en nuestro segundo día con el doctor Francis Pitar. El día de hoy platicaremos de cuantificar el sesgo en el muestreo. Es un ejercicio inútil. Les doy la bienvenida a este segundo día y es un agrado para nosotros y orgullo poder eh, nuevamente compartir este día con ustedes este tema tan importante para sus operaciones. Doy de una u otra manera la bienvenida a la licenciada Ángela Hernández para que nos apoye eh, con el tema del día de hoy en español. Muy buenos días a todos. Les voy a leer brevemente eh, la reseña de lo que será el día de hoy en, en este curso, eh, en esta plática, perdón. El tema de hoy será cuantificar el sesgo en el muestreo es un ejercicio inútil. ¿Por qué el sesgo de muestreo constantemente es un mito? Muchas personas piensan que si pueden cuantificar el sesgo de muestreo, entonces pueden decidir si pueden aceptar el sesgo o no. Desafortunadamente, en el muestreo no existe un sesgo de muestreo constante, especialmente si hay varios sesgos de muestreo superpuestos en el sistema de muestreo. Adherirse a una exactitud del muestreo totalmente rigurosa ahorrará tiempo, dinero y muchas reuniones innecesarias durante la vida útil de un proyecto. Básicamente, muestrear no es jugar a los dados. Importante, los invitamos a todos ustedes a enviar sus dudas a la sección de preguntas y respuestas, la cual se ubica en la barra inferior del programa de Zoom, simbolizada por dos recuadros de diálogo. En específico, si ustedes tienen alguna pregunta, les invitamos a que vaya justo en esta, en esta área. Asimismo, les informamos que Hoy contaremos con un intérprete en español, a petición de todos ustedes de el, el día de ayer. Pueden seleccionar el idioma en el que desean escuchar el curso en la barra inferior del programa de Zoom, haciendo clic en el botón titulado Interpretación, simbolizado con un mundo en el extremo derecho de la barra. Por mi parte es todo, sean todos bienvenidos y gracias por su asistencia. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for your participation today. Today's topic will be quantifying a sampling bias is an exercise in futility. And the question that we will address today is why handling sampling bias is a myth. Many people think that if they quantify the sampling bias, they then can decide if they can live with the bias or not. Unfortunately, in sampling, there is no such thing as a constant sampling bias especially if there are several superimposed sampling bias in the sampling system. A variance to sampling correctness with no possible negotiation will save time, money, and many unnecessary and unfortunate meetings for the many years to come during the lifetime of a project. Basically, sampling is not gambling. We would like to invite you to use the questions and answers section of this webinar to send, you, to send us your doubts. The second half of this session will be specially dedicated to answer questions. So we really encourage you to participate with any question that you should have. Additionally, it is important to mention, and as you requested yesterday, that we will have an interpreter for simultaneous translation to Spanish. In order to have access to this service, please use the bottom title interpretation that is on the right hand side of the control bar at the bottom of this program and then you can select the Spanish as your preferred language. Without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Francis Pitar, and we will start the lecture right now. Okay, so that's the one here. Uh, not sure. 
You cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Start, stop share now. There's one new stop share. New share? No. Post share? I don't know what that I don't know, dear. I really don't know. I don't know what that means. You are screen sharing. No. Because you were already sharing. Share? I guess. Now what? <laughs> I can start my my talk. I want to see your picture here. Hello, Dr. Pitard. Can you yes. hear me well? I hear you, but I don't see you. Uh, remember that yesterday when you share your screen, you see the full screen of what you're sharing. So yeah. don't worry, your live people can see you and hear you. Um, you can put your full screen exactly with the presentation. That's correct. Like it is now? Exactly. So I can proceed with the lecture? That's correct. You can start. Everything is okay. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thanks to you. Um, hello, everybody. And welcome to that lecture today, which is a follow up on what we did yesterday. Uh, we are going to talk about quantifying sampling bias. Is it a wise thing to do? Is it uh, wishful thinking? Uh, many people are especially in upper management, are making the argument that, okay, at the plant, we may not have the perfect sampling system. However, if we perform a bias test, we may be able to decide if we can live with that sampling system that is not correct. Or on the contrary, if we should think about another option, such as a, a equiprobabilistic sampling system that a few, very few manufacturers around the world can provide, such as Tecpromin in Chile, but there are a few more. And um, so we are going to comment on this because it's a very important subject as uh, many people don't realize how much a sampling system that is not correct can hurt them in a very subtle way that is very difficult to quantify, very difficult to see. Nevertheless, the, usually the, the economic consequences can be devastating. I'll just give you an example. Many years ago, we, it was a big, uh, I can tell you which company it is. It was Codelco in, uh, in Chile. And um, it was one of their operations south of Santiago that was uh, sampling the final tell, the huge plant, big flow, 10,000 cubic meter an hour going to the waste dump, and um, it was not properly sampled by taking uh, the samples that were taken, were mainly taken from the upper, third, upper half of the stream. And we argue about this sampling system for quite a few years until they decided to do a uh, to invest in a good uh, sampling system that costs maybe almost a million dollars. 
And the first month that system was in operation made the general manager very upset because he said, what happened? What is wrong with your sampling system? The, the copper content of the final tail, molybdenum content of the final tail went up by 25%. This is impossible. And uh, I answered to him and say, you know, um, this is not the way to look at it. What you should ask yourself is the fact that you are selling those tellings to a junior company and you never, you, you were never curious about the fact that the junior company was extremely successful. So that was the problem for many years. They, make, they gave a big gift to the junior company, not knowing that the copper content and the molybdenum content of the final tail was much higher as what they thought. And back calculating for 20 years of doing this, they found out that they lost $2 billion. So it's a very important subject. Usually the dollar losses are enormous and they are well hidden very difficult to see, and that's that's a problem. Okay. So bias test. This is a cartoon just to make a joke of it, but it says it all. Bias tests for sampling system are an exercise in futility. Why is that? This very the very, the reason is very simple. When you have a sampling system that is not correct, such as a pressure sampler, such as a stationary cutter in the stream or several stationary cutter in the stream, such as a cross stream sampler that is not properly designed, you know, you don't have one bias introduced by one problem. You are likely to have many, okay? So, and that is what people don't understand. This is a very complex subject. And if you are not uh, well prepared, well trained about the theory of sampling, you are not going to see anything about the problem you are dealing with, okay? So the main, there are many sampling errors. We look at them yesterday, in situ nugget effect, fundamental sampling error, grouping and segregation error, you know, increment delimitation error, increment extraction error, increment preparation error, increment weighting error, the, the short-term fluctuation error, the long-term fluctuation error, problem with cycles, and then problem with the laboratory analytical error. So now I'm going to pinpoint with the arrow here, the ones that we are concerned right now. It's correctness, increment delimitation error, okay? If you cannot cross the stream properly to take an increment, this error is devastating. Problem of recovery on impact with the cutter edge, something may happen and the sampling system may be selective on what is taking. He may take too many coarse fragments, not enough, or too many fines. So that is called the increment extraction error. This is one of the biggest generator of sampling bias in sampling. Preparation error, so that the, 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 is not always a sampling system that is at fault. Maybe is what we do to it after what we we take a sample, we send it to the laboratory, we dry it, we split it, we crush it, we pulverize it, we split it again, and uh, and the list goes on. So a bias can be introduced right here, and then so those are the bias generator. And very often, when a sampling system is not correct. Actually, there is not one bias involved. There is about four, sometimes five or six that are uh, completely independent source of bias and they add up 
in a very strange way over time, and that makes it nearly impossible to even 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 if you do a, a bias test, let's say you don't find a bias. Well, a sampling a, a sampling system that is not correct is always bias. So if you don't find the bias, it's because the bias test was not conducted properly, okay? It was incomplete. Or the reference sample was biased itself. So that's another subject. If you are going to do a bias test, you have to compare to a flawless sample. And that is very difficult because if you are capable to take a flawless sample, to compare a sampling system, then why don't you do the sampling in a flawless way every day instead of using the bad sampler? That's, uh, that's a way to look at it. And then the last thing you want to do is to compare a bad sampler with another bad sampler. In that case, we are going nowhere. We will, don't, we will not prove anything, okay? And then also, Dr. Pitard, sorry to yes. interrupt you. We are having a technical issue in the sense that the slides are a little bit blurry. So in order to correct it, can you help me please uh, to stop sharing your screen so we can again set it up? Come here. Stop sharing. Yeah, okay. Correct. Now, okay. can you click again? on sharing your screen, and you're going to see a menu. Wait for me on that menu. Can, can you see the menu where you can select the screens, screen one or PowerPoint or different? Exactly. Uh, how does we it need, look now? It looks blurry. It's because on that menu, when you choose which screen you want to share, at the bottom, there's a place that says, optimize screen share for video clip. We need to make sure it's not selected. I'm not sure. I don't see anything on my. Okay, don't worry. Let's go again. Uh, stop sharing the screen right now. Perfect. Now click on the on on the sharing screen at the top to the right. There's like a like a tick. You can click on that. This speaker view. Until yes. full screen. Full screen. That's correct. Yes. And then you see a menu where you can choose which screen you want to choose, correct? You can share PowerPoint, you can share your full screen. No. We have share screen. Uh, speaker view. Go back to the lecture. Uh, before we need to we need to correct that issue because again um, we are having that uh, blurry image. So on share screen, there's going to be a menu before you start sharing your screen. It's share out. Sc I click on share screen. Uh huh. Yes. And then some a little window pops up. Optimize screen. Exactly. That one uh, should not be selected. Should not. Okay. It is not. It is not now. Perfect. Now you can go back and choose uh, be, like, as before. Perfect. Like that? Excellent. That's perfect. Thank you so much, okay. Dr. Peter. Okay. So it looks better? Yes. Everything can see perfect. Okay. So 
basically what I was trying to explain here is that uh, when a sampling system is not correct, you just have too many problems that are adding up. And, and uh, so the only logical thing to do is prevention. It's the, all, the, it's the best strategy that you can dream of. So it takes education, of course, get comfortable with the rule of sampling correctness. You go to my book or, uh, you know, you, you go to some literature, you go to the proceeding of the World Conference on Sampling and Blending that have many good papers from uh, the best experts in sampling around the world. Uh, and then, uh, of course, if you have to do this, otherwise you won't understand the danger of bad sampling system. So sampling correctness, as far management in a company, if they want to save time, money, frustration, bad meeting with finger pointing going nowhere, they, they should have zero tolerance for sampling systems that are not correct, which, as I explained yesterday, that eliminate about 75 to 80% of the sampling system on the market today, okay? So they, they, coming back to that statement, 75 to 80% of the sampling systems that are not correct on the market today. So some people, one question, some, someone yesterday say, how come so many people are using uh, those samplers? Uh, they, not, they may be not that bad because otherwise it will not be that many people that use them. No, it's the, the problem is this. Since the theory of sampling is not well taught at universities, you have <clears throat> on the market the manufacturers that uh, build good machines, but unfortunately they are flow by design. So there's nothing you can do about it. It cannot be fixed. Okay. So, and on top of that, uh, they want to sell them. So they have usually outstanding marketing systems that are very effective to convince upper management to buy their equipment. And that does not help, you know, because uh, when you believe the salesman, when you believe the engineering firm, uh, without to do your own work first, it makes you very vulnerable to those, uh, those people that are in the business of making quick money okay that's basically the problem it's unfortunate but that's the way it is so you have to also have a good statistical understanding of sampling biases variability so obviously it comes with a very good knowledge of the theory of sampling there is no other way be aware of that now Problem number one, sampling bias are all created by some form of segregation, okay? It's because the stream is always segregated to some extent. So, and that is the problem with the sampling equipment, not capable to take segregation into account. Unfortunately, segregation is an always changing phenomenon. The stream is never segregated the same way. It navigates all over the place, depending on flow rate, on uh, many factors, you know, curves in the systems or, uh, you know. So as a result, is, that is a very strong statement. Sampling biases are never constant. And that's a problem. So problem number two, sampling bias are believed to be constant, lack analytical bias. Here on that sketch, I show you a, a, a typical example of a reproducible bias. On the vertical axis, you have 
subsampling assaying from laboratory A. And then on horizontal axis, you have subsampling assaying from laboratory B. And you see every sample here is shown by a star. And you can have a line that fits this the best. And you realize in that case that you have um, a, con a relatively constant bias on one side of the this is a, the line the transect at 45 degrees, and that is actually the one of the, the regression line, if you prefer, that show you a absolute bias. It does not matter if the grade is low or the grade is high, the, the bias is about the same. And this is an, we call that an absolute bias, it's relatively constant. In sampling, you never have a bias like that, never. This is typical of an analytical bias, okay? I'll show you another example of that. You have another type of analytical bias here. This is not an absolute bias. It's a relative bias. In other words, the lower the, the, lower the grade, the smaller the bias in absolute value, and the higher the grade, the higher the bias. So it's a relative bias, relatively constant around that line I show you here, relative to the bias sector. So we obviously have a bias here. This is typical of an analytical bias. It's another kind. And uh, it's a relative bias. Be aware that sampling bias don't behave that way. Never. So you may say, what what the a sampling bias looks like then? Give me an example. This is an example of a sampling bias. You see, when uh, the average of the bias may be shown by that dark line here, but the bias navigates all over the place. When you have a sampling bias, <clears throat> you always have a big precision problem as well because the sampling bias is not reproducible, sometimes is negligible, sometimes there is no bias, sometimes is heavily biased one way, next day is heavily, bi heavily biased the other way. So it, it navigates all over the place. In other words, even if the average of the bias is not bad relative to the bias sector, be aware that the ellipse, the precision ellipse around the bias can be quite large. And that is what people don't understand. That even if on average, the sampling bias is small or even negligible, it's going to hurt you, period. So it is, so the question is now, is it possible to use a correcting factor for a, a, a biased sampling system? Just because of what I just explained to you shortly uh, for last few slides, the answer is absolutely not. You should never do that. It can be done for an analytical bias, but never for a sampling bias. You, may, you will make things worse every time. So, <clears throat> save time, money, and frustration. Get educated. To get to that book, you can go to my website or you can go to the internet to Francis Peter Books to Amazon. You will find it. And um, I strongly recommend that book because it was written with a special objective in mind that people can <clears throat> self-train themselves on the theory of sampling. This is a third edition of my book that has been very successful over the, over the years. The first edition was 1988. 
second edition 1993, the third edition last year. So um, this is the best thing you can do, believe me on this. You will not regret to, to read and get properly educated about the theory of sampling. Another way to do it is to participate to the World Conference on Sampling and Blending that take place every two years. You know, the next one will be in Norway in, uh, let me look at the, the it will be uh, June 1 to 3, 2021, okay? We have another conference like that, more or less, and in Lima, it will be June 1, 3, no, it will be July 8 and 9, 2021 in Lima. So those conference will help you, you know, to because not only you listen at people that are competent, you know, presenting very valuable lecture on those difficulties for you, but uh, also you meet people, you meet manufacturers, you talk to them, you see their good product, you see their weak points as well. So it's uh, those conferences are very valuable for people that are interested in uh, looking at sampling system and figure out if they can live with them or not. Be preventive. That's my, my conclusion about this. So now we can, um, <clears throat> I have, we can proceed with some questions and maybe depending on the questions, I may show you another lecture since we have plenty of time about uh, what do you do if your boss say, I don't care, you do a bias test. Ah, well, you know, you have to comply with the boss. That's the way it is. That's normal life. So if you are cornered to a situation where people say, we are going to do a bus test anyway, then I will have another lecture to give you some recommendations, okay? To make sure that uh, you do the right thing. But let's have some questions first from the audience here to see where we are going with this and uh, what is the problem of many people around the world, okay? So. We are waiting for some questions to come in, Dr. Francis. Wait okay. for us one minute. Hello, we have just uh, so far one uh, from Felix from Felix Toca, Toca, Toconas. The, the question is: If the sampling bias is not possible to evaluate, how to prove to the management the metal balance is acceptable? Well. Um, uh, like I say, if management is not uh, properly educated on the theory of sampling, this is the first thing to do, is to educate management. Otherwise, you can prove nothing to them. You, it's like talking to the walls. So if the people are not... Uh, well-educated on the subject, you cannot have a conversation. And therefore, you, you will never convince them. And therefore, the only thing they are going to believe is for you to do a bias test, 
to prove if the sampling system is acceptable or not. We, we are on the wrong trajectory here. We are going nowhere. And yes, sometimes it has to be done that way because uh, top management does not understand the problem. Okay, so uh, you are, you are, I know you, and uh, working at Glencore, we have been working together before, and uh, uh, we know we know the problem very well. It's not new. Okay, let me uh, ask one question from yesterday from uh, Rafael Sanchez. For one old crush, for one old crush at P80, 90 millimeters, what would be the sampling opening of the cross sampling equipment? 90 millimeters, nine centimeters. No, uh, 2080, 28, sorry, 2080. Okay, I will do, uh, I will ask, uh, I will uh, ask. Ask the, the top size fragment. of the fragment. What is the top size of the fragment? He's only including the, uh, the P80 and for a uh, 28 millimeters. That is uh, so. It's uh, passing 80 percent passing at uh, about one inch, 28 millimeters. Yeah. So it depends on the flow rate. If it's a relatively small flow rate, like um, 500 tons an hour you can have a cutter opening that is about nine centimeter opening. It will be the job. But if it's, uh, say, 5,000 ton an hour, it will have to be about uh, 15 to 18 centimeter opening. It depends on the flow rate. The more the flow rate, the bigger the opening should be because the more the material bounce and creating problems. Okay, next question from Manuel Rodriguez from Fresnillo uh, PLC. As well, uh, as well, sorry, as we all know, the ideal for the analyze of a lab sample is having the biggest amount for for it analyze for the traditional methods of, of, of fire, it is used 50 grams of sample for gold. For gold, gold, gold and silver, what can you tell about new technologies? for the sample analyze in which is highlight the analyze up to 500 grams grams of sample with a photon aside are they trustable are we in the end of the traditional fire sampling? Okay, uh, this is a, a very good point. You know, uh, the traditional fire assay, it's uh, crush the material fine, minus uh, 100 micron, more or less, and then do a 30 gram fire assay or a 50 gram fire assay. And we know the vulnerability of that because it uh, sometimes the gold does not commute. Gold flakes remains, remain relatively coarse. You may have 
material that is 95% minus 100 micron, but nevertheless, you have you still have a few isolated gold flecks that are 200 micron, 300 micron, sometimes up to a millimeter, and that create total havoc in a result with regular fire assay. So it's not working. So we have been uh, promoting a long time that in some cases it depends on the mines, it depends on the material where it comes from, the type of deposit, the type of gold you have. You may have to go to 500 gram screen fire assay. You may have to go to multi kilograms cyanide bottle roll. You can go with uh, or you call that a uh, little, little Nelson concentrator to go around that problem. But today now, if there is a new technique with uh, photons, the company that come with this idea is an Australian company, it's called Chrysos. Huh? I know them well. And um, they have been asking me to help them to validate the technique. At first glance, I think this technique, which is new, is very promising. But nevertheless, we have to do some tests to validate it. And we are in the process of doing so with some gold mine in Australia to compare <clears throat> regular fire assay with uh, also gravity concentration, where we will have a concentrate and assay, fire assay to extinction. I mean, you may have to do uh, 10, three, uh, 15 fire assay to do the concentrate to extinction to make sure there is no bias here. And then a regular fire assay from the tail, do the weighted average. So we are going to do that on uh, many, many samples and uh, to, to validate the the technique. Okay, so that is coming. It will come in the next few months. Uh, it's in process right now in some gold mine in Australia. Okay, and I will interpret, uh, do the interpretation of the result of this and will write a validation report for the technique. But uh, to answer your question, can we trust that new technique? At that stage, I say, yes, we, you will have to wait about those results to, to make sure. But the fact that the, the ultraviolet energy of those beams is very strong, there is no way that if you present a sample that is 500 gram or even one kilo, to that probe, there is no way that any gold particle will escape. So I'm fairly confident that it's going to work well. Okay, next question from Gerardo Miranda. Does the human error is considered as, as vice or only is considered the efficient of the equipment? No, the, the human error can introduce a huge bias. Huh? So the human error is uh, <clears throat> oh, that raises an issue here that on the subject of sampling, you have to use very well-trained people. It is wrong to hire somebody in the street here and say, okay, you have uh, three days of training and you are on your own at sample preparation. This is looking for a catastrophe. It takes six months to train someone properly to do sample preparation properly, you know, so the training is a key here. You cannot take a shortcut on this. And then, that way there's another issue. If you if it takes six months to train someone, uh, don't let them go after that. You have to give them an incentive to stay with you. So you know what I mean. 
Okay, next no question from Roger Aragon. Big thing, points of sampling, how do we choose them? Repeat the question, please. Big thing, points of sampling, how do we choose them? Big things. Uh, uh, big, big thing, like big point, big point, points of, of sampling, how do we choose them? Well, every case is different here. You know, uh, to, if you want to install a good sampling system, that is very good. Usually, the best way is to go at the discharge of a stream. The discharge of a conveyor belt under that discharge, you will have a cross stream sampler. A flotation plant, a lot of material in a big flow rate, maybe 5,000 cubic meter an hour, 10,000 cubic meter an hour, things like that. You go to the discharge of that stream, and right under the discharge, we are going to install a cross stream sampling system. Usually, the best place to do that properly is as a discharge of streams. It's the only place where we can do that properly. There is no way you can do it in the stream. There is no way you can do it from above the belt, you know. That's my recommendation. Okay, next question from Felix, Felix Toconas. The adjustment of the metal balance is possible considering the difference of the metal value as a variance. Is that a submission correct? Hi, Felix, by the way. Okay. Um, in order to do material balance, not only you have to make sure that the sampling system are not biased, that's number one. And then after that, there is another issue. It's that you have to achieve very high precision in the sampling system. In other words, you have to be using outstanding sampling protocol. So at the end of the day, when you add the variance of the feed to the variance of the tail to the variance of the concentrate, and then they add up, you know, if, if you don't have excellent precision at each point, you end up with an excessive variance that is forcing you to, to wait. You do a material balance one day, but it cannot is not conclusive because the precision is not good enough. So you wait two days, three days, one week, and maybe at the end of the week you can have an average that has a reasonable variance to find out if the reconciliation is is okay or not. So you are very vulnerable on two issues here: the bias, of course, that's number one. And then the precision should be very robust and uh, that you have to use outstanding protocol. You know, you have to have a good sampling system, good subsampling system, good sample preparation, good analytical error, so that the, the variability should be very, very small. I give you an example, uh, you know, if you look at the variability at the mine, we say, well, um, copper mine, is it uh, plus or minus 10%, uh, 15%, okay, for copper or molybdenum? I say, yes, as long as you don't have a bias, it's no problem. You say, is the same precision at the plant okay for uh, material balance? I would say absolutely not. To do reliable material balance at the plant, you will have to achieve much better, like plus or minus, uh, two or three percent, you know, for copper on the feed, on the tails, and maybe one percent on the concentrate. So that is far more difficult, okay? Okay, next question, David Torres. Can a variographic analyze detect bias? 
I did a non-probabilistic -prob analysis well, that had excellent result with a very attractive view. Uh, Variographic analysis of data, you always learn something. Even if the sampling system is biased, you are going to learn something from the variographic analysis. So, but it's not the panacea, okay? The variographic analysis will be a whole lot more valid if it was samples taken by a correct sampling system. But nevertheless, with variographic analysis, you always learn something. What is going to pop out is unpredictable and uh, it's good to learn that uh, information sometime, even if the samples are not perfect. The variogram will tell you if the sampling system has a problem. It won't, it won't, it won't quantify the bias. Eh? Let's not make, make, get me wrong on this. But it will tell you if there is a problem. OK, next question. Uh, Angeles, can, can we make more trustable the sampling process for gold and silver? Can we make? Can we make? Yes. Can we make more trustable the sampling process for gold and silver? Well, you know, uh, it depends on the product. It depends on the deposit. It depends what kind of gold and silver you're talking about. The first thing to do here is to get that information from the geologist, I told you. So, you know, so we know uh, the property, the sampling property of the gold and the silver in the operation you are dealing with. That's very important. So when I go to an operation, either doing exploration or even doing production, my first question to those people is, where is the gold or the silver? But be careful. Don't give me one answer. You have to answer that question in 20 different ways. Where is the gold? Is it clustering? What is the size of the gold particles? What is their association with other minerals? Are they within other minerals or nearby other minerals? They, can they concentrate on the, in a vein of sulfides, for example? Are they uh, disseminated in quartz veins? You, you, there are many ways to answer that question. And unless we have a very well-documented answer to that question in many ways, we, we, we don't know what is the right thing to do. Okay, We don't know what kind of sampling equipment we are going to need. And we don't know what kind of protocol we have to implement. You know and put in practice with the proper sampling system. So it starts with, where is the gold? 20 different ways to answer that question. OK, next question, David Hilles. Is it worth taking many cheap samples across a silver gold, bidding, buying for great for great, uh, sorry, for great control and reserve calculation in a mine, or better, a shortened amount of channel samples. I'm not sure I understand the questions. It's, um... it's uh, okay, again, is it worth taking many economy samples across a silver gold bearing buying for great control and reserve calculation in a mine, or better, a shorter amount of channel samples? Well, the sampling, no matter what you do, the sampling must be correct. So if it's a very cheap grab sample, uh, you're going nowhere. A properly, properly designed channel sample underground, for example, 
will be far superior to to grab samples. So many many bad samples will not give you good information. You are better off with a few good quality samples. So either taken by drilling, taken by channel sampling, taken with uh, the best you can do in open pit with blast holes, but uh, stay away of many grab samples that are not correct and completely uh, uh, operator dependent, you know. So for example, underground, some people are in love with what we call mock sample. They go to the, uh, the pile after blast, they take uh, five kilo or three kilo and send that to the lab. They take many of those samples. Those samples are useless, completely useless. Okay, next question, Danilo Javier. About the relationship between feed top side particular investing sampler and its opening, what is your recommendation? Okay, if the flow is relatively small, which is uh, the case most of the time with Vezen sampler, Vezen sampler are usually used for less than 500 ton an hour or uh, less than 500 cubic meter an hour. They are relatively small units. So the cutter opening should be about, uh, for solids, it should be on the, remember the cutters are radial, okay? So the smaller opening that cross the stream when it go in rotation. The smaller opening is the inner part of the stream that they cross here. That part, that opening should be about three times the size of the coarse fragment if the fragments are more than one centimeter. If they are, uh, if it's very fine material, you cannot go smaller than one centimeter opening at that point. It's not a good thing to do, you will have a bias, okay? So it, it depends on the size distribution. For a, for a flotation plant where the material is relatively fine, you, you should have uh, the small cutter opening here at the, near the center, about one centimeter. And then in the middle of the stream, it will be here, it will be maybe two or three centimeter here. Okay, next question. Anonymous, anonymous question. It, if it's possible to compare a sample got in an incorrect weight with one that could be taken correctly of the sample flow, is possible that an incorrect sampling system be performing well? Someday, yes, by sheer luck. Uh, it, it, it depends again, you know, like I say, the sampling bias is not going to be constant, okay? So one day is going to be biased one way, another day is going to be reasonably well, no bias. The day after is going to be biased the other way. So that thing is going to navigate all over the place, which is no good, you know. Uh, <coughs> um, Let me think here. Remember, everything I say during those two days, if the sampling system is not correct, you are playing with fire, okay? Even if you do a test that shows that there is no significant bias, you are playing with fire. Number one, let, let me put a, a very strong point here about people that do bias test. With a bias test, you can prove only one thing. Remember that. You can, prove, you can only prove that the sampling system is biased. You cannot prove 
and will never prove that a sampling system is not biased. Okay, next question, Everardo Suarez. If we do a bias test in a copper concentrate for two methods, it will be okay a bias of 0.5% copper is near to 2% relativeness. How can we decide how much we can accept? That is a, this is a, a decision for upper management to take. Uh, this is a very important question here. Can I show you some slides? Can I, we go to a, a lecture and show you some slides on this since we have plenty of time? Yes, of course, Dr. Pitar. Go ahead. Okay. Because as we I'm, did before. I'm going to do that, but I have to. Uh, how do I, I do that? I have to minimize the screen here. Exit full screen. Go to my. No, I have to go to FPSC. Minimize. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, God, how do we do this? Is it Excel, Word, or PowerPoint, or what? <clears throat> I don't know. Practically. I don't know how to do this without to mess up everything. Without to measure. Without no worries, Dr. Pitard, just as you did before, exactly as you did before, it should be fine. We, I need to go in my files, but... Don't close that. I need to minimize this and see the... I can, And slideshow? No. I don't think so. I don't know. I don't know how to get back there. I don't know how to do that without to exit the zoom. The, the zoom. How are we doing, Dr. Pitard? Okay, now you're getting somewhere. I'm getting somewhere, but it's slow. I'm sorry about this. That's perfect. We are happy to wait. I don't know. I want to go to FPSC. Sampling course. That is a lecture I want to show. Hannah, how do I? Is that in PowerPoint? No. no. 
Uh, hmm. So that's the lecture I want to show. Now what? I have to go back to my webinar. Uh, share maybe? Where? No, that didn't work. No. Hmm. If I put this on the full screen, do you see what I put on the screen here? Not yet, Dr. Pitar, can you help me out going back to the Zoom uh, menu? And you can click on share screen, which is the green button again. Where is this? Well, there's a Zoom thing. Zoom? Mm -hmm. OK, you need to get your Zoom menu. Okay. You, you won't find it up there. Share. Try it. Mm. Uh, you don't have a Zoom option here. I don't know how to go back to them here. No. This? No. You ought to be this. It should be. Click, click on Zoom. Click on Isabel. You found uh, you found some again, Dr. Pitar? I don't know how to get back to you. Okay. Can you please check on the menu bar of the windows? Below you, you should have both PowerPoint and you should have Zoom. So click, click on Zoom? Yes, on the Windows bar, click on Zoom. Good and day. then move your mouse around so that it can display the menu, the black menu. Bigger. I don't understand. Isabel, we have your picture and we have the lecture that he wants to display, but we don't have a, a Zoom menu. Oh, okay, perfect. Now I get what's going on. Can you please go to my face? And can you move your mouse around my face? Yes. And then at the bottom, you will see four buttons. And at the last one, you're gonna see a, a arrow that goes uh, diagonally. Okay. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Now you should be able to see the menu at the, at the bottom. Are you able to do it now? Yes. Uh, uh, so. No, you don't. You need to go up with this. Screen. And then a share. And then the share screen, exactly. And click on your lecture. OK. There we go. Excellent. So now we can stop. Yes. OK. We see you and we see the so, slides. So we are ready. Thank you, Dr. Pitari. Thank you very much. Um, this is a guideline that I wrote and present in a world conference on sampling and blending. And um, I, I can uh, email it to you later on, you know, 
I can email it to Isabel and she will pass it to the, the people that are listening at my lecture, okay? So, Hodge allotted variability is reasonable for the fundamental sampling error. That, that's the error that is generated by the mass of the sample you take, either the primary sampler, secondary sampler, or the final analysis at the laboratory. So it depends on uh, what is acceptable to you, you know, where, where you work. Uh, it, it highly depends on where you work. Is 40% okay, 32, 16, 10, 5, 1? Obviously, uh, we need some uh, guideline here to help people. So it depends on the data quality objective. You should have well-defined objective when you, when you do sampling. There are various points of view on this. You have the geologist, you have the great control engineer, you have the metallurgist in charge of material balance, you have the metallurgist minimizing impurity in high purity material, you have the people in charge of trade of commodities and also environmental assessment. So all of those people are going to have different guidelines because they work with different, uh, different level of tolerance, okay? For we talk precision here, no bias. Bias is another issue. You make sure your sampling system are not biased. So all of those people have something in common. The fundamental sampling error is not their only problem. They are other problems. They are uh, grouping and segregation. They are analytical error. They are uh, uh, precision generated by small bias, you know, that kind of thing. So they are, all of those are adding up. We group them. We group all of those additive error as residual sampling and analytical errors. You, I emphasize again, you should have done your best to eliminate the bias generator the best way you can. So let's say there are N sampling stage, a primary sampling stage, a secondary sampling stage, and then the final analytical sampling stage as a balance room when you take a, a few grams for the analysis. So now, the, the question is, how much is acceptable, how much is acceptable uncertainty for each of us, you know? So some sampling errors are extremely difficult to quantify. That's why you have to make sure that you eliminate all the source of bias first, but it's never going to be perfect. You will always have some residual tiny little bias with their precision. You will have always some uh, problem with uh, segregation that's in, that you can minimize by taking many increment. The only thing you can do on those, as we say over and over for two days, is to be preventive. So we assume we have been preventive, okay? So now, let's use a logical approach. Step number one, allow a total allotted uncertainty that we can live with it. <clears throat> for example, for exploration, for gold, if you do plus or minus 32%, you're doing well. Exploration for copper, plus or minus 20%. I'm talking about the maximum, huh? after you add all the source of uncertainty. For material balance for gold, 10%. Material balance for copper, 5%. Sales of concentrate for gold, 3%. Sale of concentrate for copper, 1%. Okay? So those are the maximum acceptable for different kind of people, of course. 
So you are going to allow half of the total allotted uncertainty we just mentioned now to the res residual error and analytical error. So for example, uh, exploration for gold total 32%, uh, precision, this is a precision statement, okay? Precision does not, does not have additive property. You have to do the calculation with the variance. So when you do uh, 0.32 square and take uh, divide that by two, and then take the square root again, allotting half of that for the residual variance, you will get 22.6 for the residual error, okay? And for grade control for copper, say a total of 20%, you will, if you allow half of that to the residual errors, you will have 14%. And then you allow the over half to the total fundamental sampling error. Same thing, you will get 22.6 for the total of the different fundamental error you have a fundamental error for each sampling stage, remember. Okay. Now the fundamental sampling error can be divided between the various sampling stage in an appropriate way. <clears throat> so for example, you are going to allow half of that to the primary sampling stage, which is the total variability that we were talking about divided by four, because remember you, you took half to the residual and then half of that for the total fundamental error. Now we take half of that half for the fundamental error, which is the total divided by four, and that gives you 16% for the goal, okay? Etc. Secondary sampling system, half again, so it's divided by eight. Tertiary sampling system at the laboratory, for example, half again, so it's divided by 16. So you will have respectively 16% for uncertainty for the primary sampling stage, 11% for the secondary sampling stage, 8% for the final sampling stage, okay? For grade control, for precious metals, you know, so that gives you this. For base metals, you go a little more stringent. I'm talking about exploration grade control. You do the same calculation, so it will be respectively uh, this for the all the sampling error, you know, and this for the fundamental error. Now. For guideline for process control, it's a little tighter. Yeah. And then guideline for commercial sampling. Now for precious metal, it will be respectively 3% total residual uncertainty for the error you, don't, you have been trying to minimize 2%. Total fundamental error, 2%, you know. For base metal, you can go tighter, 1%, 0.7, So that leaves what? For the primary sampling stage, an uncertainty of 1.5. The secondary sampling stage, 1.1. The tertiary sampling stage, 0.75, and so on. Okay, so you see what is a, you follow that guideline, how I do it. You know, in the book is better is is better explained, but I can send you that lecture, and that gives you a, a guideline for everybody, depending if you are at the mine, at the plant, in commercial, or dealing with uh, copper or uh, precious metal. You will have a guideline here that will tell you how to distribute the uncertainty at the different place where you do sampling from the primary sampler to the final sampling stage at the laboratory, okay? 
So I, I can send you that lecture if you want, okay? Uh, your turn to talk. Thank you, Dr. Pitard. Uh, if you are okay with this, we can continue with the questions that the public yes. has, sent, has sent us, okay? Go ahead. So, Felipe, we would like for you to start with the question. Yes, of course. Next, next question, Flor de Maria. Could you please give us some bibliographic suggestion for the evaluation of a mineral deposit under exploration to determine the samples number and mass to be collected. In this case, we can determine the mineral, mineralogical characteristic, but not the total mass of the natural depos deposit. Okay, this is a, yeah, that's an interesting question because a long time ago, I was in charge of an exploration program myself. It was a deposit for nickel. And I know the subject very well. We had about six drilling machines in the field. We had a diamond drill, we had a river circulation, we had percussion. So uh, when you work with a new deposit, the very first thing to do is to know what you're dealing with, what kind of beast are you trying to, to control, okay? So you are a geologist, you do your homework, you know you have a target somewhere that is promising. So at first, don't do too many drilling. Number one, you are in exploration, you don't know for sure where the deposit is, you don't know for sure if you have a deposit in the first place. So in that case, you do fast drilling with reverse circulation, okay? No sense to go to high quality at that stage. Fast drilling with reverse circulation. So at at one point, you are going to have a target and say, oh, this is a we have a potential target here. Now, what, what is the right thing to do? We do infill with river circulation? I said, no. Go back to diamond drill with uh, HQ diameter if it's not too deep, and Q diameter if you have to go very deep. But uh, do some diamond drill. You don't have to do many. You can do some kind of a cross on the potential target with diamond drill. And from those diamond drill, maybe you will have, I don't know, uh, between a dozen or 20 diamond drill covering the promising target. And from that, you have to do your mineralogical study of what you are dealing with. It's very important that, again, you have to answer that question. If it's gold, where is the gold? Answer the question 20 different ways, we need to know. And that goes for other minerals, for copper as well, for molybdenum especially. And, um, you know, it's this approach is universal, okay? And then when you know the mineralogy of that stuff quite well, now you can go back to much more drilling and field drilling. Do you have to do, to do it with diamond core? It would be nice, but it's expensive. You can shift back to river circulation, you know, and um, compare what you get with the diamond drill you got. So that, that will be my approach, okay? It's, um, you have to do different different level, different technique of drilling at first, and then go full blast at one point to know your deposit better. To At that stage, when you 
when you are when you know enough from the mineralogy with the diamond drill, when you know enough from the general contour of what the deposit is, then you shift back to river circulation to do a lot of drilling. And then at that stage, how many drill? When do you stop? That is a geostatistical problem. You shift to geostatistics. Now you are ready to give some information to geostatistician, and they will help you with diagrams to tell you if you have to stop drilling, if they know enough or not. Okay, that's my approach. Okay, next question, Carlos Nasi. In your experience, experience, what is approximately the cost of building a good sampling system for a high-grade gold or silver copper mine flotation plant in the range of 10,000 or 15,000 per day? Hi, Carlos, by the way. Um, This is a good question for TechProMain, by the way. <laughs> Ask them. And uh, I will say that uh, for gold, a flotation plant, um, for the, the feed sampler after, if, if it's gold, you should have, you, you have to be careful here. Number one, I don't like to sample for gold before the ball mill. Usually you have to decide, and again, it depends on what kind of deposit you are dealing with. If it's a deposit that requires gravity concentration, make sure that you have a gravity concentration circuit that works very well at all time. Because that is the best sample of all. Always get rid of the coarse gold right away and the gravity concentration circuit is a perfect way to do this. And the gravity concentration circuit will tell you how much coarse gold you add. You cannot sample that you have to trust the gravity concentration circuit. Now, if this is done well, we are ready to feed the cyclone overflow going to the plant, you know, after the coarse goal has been eliminated. And uh, that sampling system should not be very expensive. A, a good cross-stream sampling system here will require maybe a, a primary cross-stream sampler and then a secondary, maybe, maybe a tertiary Vezen sampler. So we are talking about, I don't know. I, this is a question for TechProMin, but I will say we are talking about uh, 150,000 maybe for that sampling station. And then you will have a similar sampling station for the final tear. Okay, okay. Uh, anonymous question. How can you re revise that your sampling system is performing well? by doing visual inspection every, every shift. This, after you install a sampling system that is correct, that is properly designed, properly installed, operating properly, you have to make a commitment to it. Number one, you have to clean it every working shift. That is not negotiable. And every working shift, the operator has to be doing an inspection. He has to, you give him a list, click, 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 I checked every point. And as soon as something look funny, you know, he has to give you that sheet and say, we got a problem here and we better fix it. He cannot wait. We have to do it now, okay? Sometimes there are minor problems you can fix in-house. 
Sometimes there are major problems that it would be a better idea to have a maintenance contract with the manufacturer than let to let a, a how you call that a maintenance department to to damage the sampling system because they are not trained to to deal with that kind of equipment. Okay, it takes special training to maintain sampling systems. So the best strategy you can have here is, for example, every two or three months, have a contract with the manufacturer. They come do an inspection of their own. They replace a few parts for you. And that will save you time and money in the long run, okay? Because you know it will be well done. But you have to have that daily inspection and cleaning from the operators to pinpoint little problems when they show up, okay? Okay, next question from Danilo Javier. What can you say about the cross belt sampler? Do you think we can have a good sampling in this kind of device? The answer is no. I, um, I mentioned it yesterday in, in one lecture. Uh, stay away from this the best you can. Because uh, there are some, they are about eight major problems in that kind of sampler. And half of them, you can minimize the problem, yes. But half of them, there is nothing you can do about it. And it will, it cannot be, the problem cannot be minimized. And because of that, I divorce them completely. It's just a troublemaker as far as you're concerned in your operation. Okay, next question, Rodolfo Espinel. What are the best and most common use QPI uh, uh, eyes to measure bias? And what are the most applicable biases measure, measurements for a metal reconciliation between the mill and the mine? Well, This is an extremely difficult question eh, because it's very complex. Everybody has problems. The mine have their bias of their own. The plants have their bias of their own. Okay. So there is no such a thing as the mine is at fault and the plant is right or vice versa that does not exist, I have absolutely no illusion on that. Everybody has to do its homework. Everybody has to identify their structural problem I was mentioning yesterday. That's very important. And then when you analyze the structural problem in a meeting with all of those guys involved, the miners, the geologists, the labs, the metallurgists, you come with a consensus and say, okay, now, how are we going to compare the plant with the mine? You cannot do a comparison between the mine and the plant until the plant has flawless sampling system. So for example, if at the plant, you have a cross belt sampler, if you have stationary cutter, if you have pressure samplers, that we know they are not correct. We know they have many biases. So why, why to do a comparison with the mine? We are going nowhere here. We don't know what we are doing. So in order to do a comparison with the mine, we have to have a flawless system somewhere. So because of that, my advice is this, the sacred sample, that is a sacred sample where the sampling system must be perfect, is a feed to the plant. Because that sampling system is going to be not only a reference for the metallurgist to do good material balance, 
but it should also be a reference for the miner to identify what is it that he exactly sent to the plant. There is no other way. So that sampling system must be sacred, must be perfect, and that is where you have to spend the money to have a, a, a system you can trust. Okay, next question from Roman Cruz. Does it exist a representative sampling method for the cyclones feeding? Of course, or the, the cyclone overflow? Or the feed to the cyclones? I guess for the for the feed coming the cyclone from the, overflow. From the van. Yeah, the, the, after the gravity circuit, if you need one, you can sample the cyclone overflow. Okay, you don't sample the flow going to the cyclone. You have uh, an underflow that is recycled somewhere else, you know, and then those, those, uh, the best sampling system is a cyclone overflow where usually everything is going to go to that point sooner or later. It's a matter of time. Okay, the underflow go back in circuit, you know, in circle. Okay, unless you have a gravity concentration circuit, but that that's a different. That's good, but it's a different approach. Both in both cases, your best sample is the cyclone overflow, and in some cases, is a cyclone overflow plus the production of the gravity concentration circuit. Next question, Peter, Peter Bersnaida from Medellin, Colombia. What would you recommend it to improve the quality of channel samples in underground called mining all vines and phase developments? Um, this is uh, it's, it's important. Huh? You have to you have to train the operator very nicely here about how to take channel samples. Uh, sometimes you can take them on the side, on the wall. Sometimes you want to take them on the face. Be aware of one thing. The, 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 the point number one here, make sure you do that in a very safe way. Safety come first. It's not always very safe to sample a face. After, um, after you blast uh, a section underground. But, you know, you have to do it sometime. You, the, how, to go, how to take a channel samples, it's explained in my book. You know, you can go for more details in this. It's, it's well explained. But remember always, safety comes first, okay? And um, one thing is, let's say you do a channel sample with a hammer, okay? The, the operator draw a, a little canal, a, a, a little channel here, and he has to take everything with a hammer. So that may fall directly in a bucket, or it may fall on a top on the, on the ground. Make sure he never subsamples that by hand. Everything that come out of the wall with his hammer must go to the sample, to the laboratory. No subsampling by end. Never. Okay, next question. Adrian Mosler. What kind of sample can you recommend, recommend us to reduce the slurry sampler can you recommend to us, considering that our plant's sampler in six hours take 18 liters? Oh, you want to subsample the samples that come to the laboratory with a slurry sampler? Yes, uh, there are devices on the market that are, exist. Um, um, you know, a company like TechProMin can 
can build one for you. We can use a tiny little Vezen sampler to do that, you know, and uh, it has to be more or less customized. You tell exactly what you do. So you will put uh, the feed and then you will have uh, cutters that go in circle to take a sample of that. Be, be careful not to go too small because you have to have, you have to respect the sample mass you need for the fundamental errors that I was explaining in my guideline. Be careful about that. You know, so you may not be go, able to go as small as you, as you may wish. But if you have 18 liters, I will say, yes, you can go smaller than that with a good uh, rotating, uh, very little pheasant sampler will be the best. Okay. It can be customized for you. Okay, next question, uh, Ramon Alanis. In a plant with a sack mill in which a gravity concent concentrator is installed to recover gold in the underflow of the cyclones. What will be the sampling points to reduce sampling errors? Okay, so that's that go back to what I was saying earlier. This is a very good question, by the way. So if you have a gravity concentration circuit for gold, you have to trust your gravity concentration circuit. Here you are going to have Nelson concentrators. You have to make sure the entire feed go to the to the gravity concentration circuit, and then <clears throat> the after that go to the cyclone overflow. The cyclone overflow will be your first sampling station for the operation. Okay, don't try to sample the gold before before the, the gravity circuit. You are, going, you are going nowhere with that one. It's too difficult, it's too expensive, and it will never be a good system, okay? So you have to trust your gravity concentration circuit. Make sure you have good security here. Make sure you are well aware of the total production of gold coming from the gravity circuit. Don't mix it with over gold coming from the over end of the process. Make sure you know how much gold is produced by the gravity circuit, and that is your best sample of all. And then after that, you add what you find from the cyclone overflow, and then also taking into account what you eliminated with the final tear, okay? But make sure you have a gravity circuit that is well under control. That is your best option. Okay, next question, Jorge Campos. For metallurgical samplers, respecting the opening according to the particle size, does it exceed minimum or maximum velocity limits in the operation for the sampling obtaining? Uh, tellings? Repeat the question, please, if you don't mind. Yes. For metallurgical samplers, respecting the openings according to the particle size, does it exist minimum or maximum velocity limits, limits in the operation for the sampling obtaining? Okay. Uh, be aware that there is a limit for the speed of the stream for sampling system to work properly. We find out a long time ago, there have been some study done on that, but many years ago, that if a stream flow rate is more than two meters per second, the sampling system start to deteriorate, even if it's a good sampling system. So if you have evidence that the stream is a three meters per second or four meters per second, sometimes even more, we got a problem, okay? You have to find a way 
to minimize the speed of the stream. So sometimes you have to enlarge the stream before you reach the discharge point, because at the discharge point, the stream should not navigate faster than two meters per second, okay? Otherwise, you will have problems. Okay, Gustavo Roldan, what kind of a specific sampling system can you recommend it for silver and gold or of low, low quality, both for crush, mineral, and slurry? It's the same. You have to have a cross stream sampler for cyclone overflow, for the tellings, for the concentrates. You, you, uh, it, it goes by the same rule. The sampling system should not be biased, okay, by design. And then after that, you have to be careful with your uh, sampling protocol because if you are looking at a very low grade, you may have a severe, severe problem with sample mass. You may have to assay much more than 30 grams or 50 grams. And that is why, why we, you may consider like uh, the new system with Krasos, with, uh, you know, with uh, ultraviolet uh, bombardment, you know, uh, this is, but you, you still have to have correct sampling system, no matter what. Okay, next, next question, anonymous question. That, does this exist a quick or experimental evaluation to determine if a plant sampling system is, is the correct one, is the correct one? Uh, can I ask you a favor here? Can I take a break, Ooh, uh, two minutes? I need to take a break okay. for two minutes. Okay. And, then, and then you repeat that question when I come back. Okay, sure. Yeah. Oh, I think another thing. Stephen says that there is no record of Norman ever being in jail in Wright County. Huh? That's what he said. I said, not right. I'll make her. Hang on, hang on, I have to check something. Okay, sorry, I apologize for that. Now I'm ready. Can you repeat the last question, please? Yes, doctor. An animal, an anonymous question. Does it exist a quick or experimental evaluation to determine if a plant sampling system is this correct one? He's uh, talking about head concentrate and tailings. The only hope for answering a question like that is based on visual inspections. You have to rely on a very competent expert to do this. You know, it's the only way to do it. 
it's uh, for sure. Okay, because uh, if you rely on bias test, you are going, you are going to have, you are going to be confused with the results. Okay, and that is no good. Rely on a very good sampling expert. Like I say, there are not many around the world today. There are maybe five or six, but this is the only way to go if you really want to do it right. Okay, next question, Ramona Lanis. There is always a difference between mind and plan or a size. Mm -hmm. The question is, what is the best way to reduce errors in the reconciliation between mind and plan a size? What is the, what is the accept, acceptable error? If you have, yeah, it's a very common problem, you know. If you find, let's say you have a gold mine. If you find 5% less gold at the plant that what the mine announced, that's expected and it's unlikely that you will ever do something better than that, okay? But you have interesting developments sometimes. If you have, for example, 15, 20% less gold at the, at the plant, obviously there's something wrong, okay? So we have to investigate what's going on at the mine. And uh, there's another issue here, sometimes, you find more gold at the plant that what the mine announced. Now that is in a way is good news, but it's also bad news because it means that we underestimate the deposit. And if we underestimate the deposit, then we have lost opportunities, obviously somewhere. So it's, it's good news, but it's also dangerous not to find, not to go to the bottom of it. So you have to, you know, uh, re reconciliation problems are expected, okay? For in a copper mine, if you find two or three percent less copper at the plant that uh, what is announced by the mine, you are doing very well, okay? But, uh, you will always have some reconciliation problem, no matter what. Hmm? Yes, it's something to, to keep an eye on because it can reach proportions that need serious investigation, okay? Okay, next question, Mario Venezia. Could we determine at what information would we take from an early stage test like WISCAM, MLS, mineralogic test to introduce a sampling methodology either from mining sampling or from plant sampling as well? Uh. Can you repeat the question? I, 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 I don't understand the beginning of the question. Yes, could, you, we, could we determine what information could we take from an early, early stage test like Westcan MLS? I, I think uh, he's talking about uh, F, FCA CAM, mineralogic test to introduce a sampling methodology either from mining sampling or from plant sampling as well? Um, no, it's not the right way to do it. The, the best thing to do is to have a very careful inspection of diamond core drilling. You know, when you do the logging of those core sample, we have all the information here that we need for optimizing any kind of sampling we are going to do later on. You know, the feeds, the, the, the tellings, all sorts of stuff like that. 
we we should rely on good visual mineralogical investigation of core samples. Okay, next question, Lydia Chavira. How can we detect segregation problems for metallurgical samplers? Repeat, please. It's a yes, short question. How, how can we detect segregation problems for metallurgical samplers? Segregation? Are we, how can we detect segregation problems? It's what that the word was segregation? Yes. Yes, the problems of segregation. Okay. You, in, in any, any stream that you have in a plant, you will have segregation, okay? And that is why it's, you cannot control segregation. It's inevitable. And that is why we have to have cross-stream samplers. A well-designed cross-stream samplers is not sensitive on across the stream segregation. It does not matter if the stream is segregated. That's the beauty of all samplers. Okay, so uh, you're not going to control segregation. Where is going to take place and how much is going to take place is unpredictable, really. You, it's out of your control, okay? Okay, next question, Johnny Corijocla, regarding Health sampling, if it's a concentrate plant, it is more representative the slurry sampling of the huge size mineral sampling that is fit for a bell before entering to the mill. Which of both systems have a MPRE bias during the sampling process? I'm, I'm confused with that question. I don't, I don't follow the logic of the questions. Okay, so I'm not sure. Repeat it slowly, please. Okay, regarding health sampling, that what what kind of sampling? Bell sampling. Uh, is for a concentrate plant. Is a concentrate. A, yeah, concentrate plant. Okay. And, and the question is: Is more representative the slurry sampling or the huge size mineral sampling that is fit for a bell before entering to the to the mill? You. <clears throat> It's debatable. It depends on the local condition. But uh, I will trust more a slurry sampler. But it can be done either way. You know, we can sample the solids before you put them in slurries. But we can, it can be done either way, but I will, I will trust better when you do a slurry and then uh, send that to a cross rim sampler. I will trust that approach better. Okay, Brian Francisco Gonzalez, how is possible to calculate accuracy and uncertainty in a sampling without having a standard reference? Uh, <clears throat> to do calculation in sampling, you don't need a reference sample. You, you do it with the theory of sampling. You have to do some calculation for the fundamental error. You have to do some calculation with uh, ex uh, some variograms you are going to do to optimize sampling interval. Or there, there are several issues in sampling in a plant, okay? There are 
problem with a fundamental error, I gave you the guideline and I will send it to you, okay? And then there are also issues about should you take a cut every 15 minutes, every 10 minutes, every five minutes? A variographic experiment will answer that question very well, okay? So you may have to do some variographic experiments sometime. Variographic experiment consists of taking many samples at short interval, one day, every minute you take a sample, and then you, you, you analyze every cut. So you may have 60 cuts, each cut taking at one minute interval with the results from the lab on those 60 samples, you may do a variogram. And from that variogram, you can see right away what is uh, appropriate time on a normal day to cross the stream. Shall you take a cut every five minutes, every 10 minutes, every 15 minutes? Can you go as long as 20 minutes? That, it's a problem with variography, okay? That will answer that question very well. Okay, next question, anonymous question. Is it the same as sampling system for operative control and a sampling system for metallurgical balance? Okay, that's a good question. You know, uh, you know those uh, funny looking samplers that you have on the market that I say you cannot use those sampler for material balance, okay? Absolutely not. That is uh, stationary cutters, multi-cutters, stationary across the stream, pressure sampler, things like that. You know, uh, a quick grab sample for plus on four percent solids, for example, all of that, those samplers can be used, be careful about it, but can be used for process control. Huh? But they cannot be used ever for material balance, for metallurgical accounting. Okay, that's it's two, two different family of sampling system and uh, they are not compatible. You know, they have completely different objective when you look at a sampling, uh, at a stream, and you want to know if the, the percent solid has been changing in an un unacceptable way, well, you know, you take a grab sample, you go to your Marcy balance, and then you find out uh, very quickly if this is okay or not, okay? That's fine. Process control sampling it can be done that way. But metallurgical accounting where you need a very high level of accuracy, exactitude, huh? when you need a very high level of accuracy, you have to have flawless sampling stations. That's two different, completely different world, okay? And I have a comment here. When, uh, say I am a general manager at the operation, I said to myself, how do I win the battle? How do I make sure that my operation is optimized? Is it with process control? or is it with metallurgical accounting? Obviously, it's process control. You control, uh, you win the battle with process control. So you have to be on top for process control to do a lot of sampling. It does not have to be exact. It can be a little bit biased, it's no big deal, but you have to do a lot of sampling for process, quick process control. And that is where online analyzers are doing exceptionally well, okay? Now, what about metallurgical accounting? Metallurgical accounting, it's after the facts. The battle is already there, it has already done. So it's what is the objective of metallurgical accounting? 
Well, it's for the top, the general manager to sleep well at night. Otherwise, he has no way of knowing to verify if things go well or not. It's a verification process. It's not a process to control things. It's an after the fact verification. Okay, so be careful here not to mix those two different philosophy. Philo process control is inescapable. Metallurgical accounting, it's a verification for people, for people high level in the company to be reasonably sure that the operation is functioning properly to do reconciliation with the mine, stuff like that. So it's completely different objectives. Huh? Thank you, Dr. Pitard. I'll be supporting Felipe. Uh, this time I'll, I'll be reading the next question, which come from anonymous um, person. He's asking, for chemical laboratories, it is spoken about an uncertainty in the sampling process, according to ISO 17025. In sampling theory, it is mentioned that the sampling error. What is the difference between uncertainty and error for sampling? Okay. Yeah, I have another lecture on this, but you know, it will take too long to find out where it is. Um, I have a long development in my book on this. The difference between uh, the difference between uncertainty and uh, bias, if you you know, it's um, let me think. Let me put my act together here. Mm. How to explain that in a simple way? Can I postpone the answer on this later? Yeah, of course, we can come back later. I have to think about this. Put that question aside, and we are going to revisit it at the, at the end, OK? It's OK, that's OK. <clears throat> but I want to explain that in a, in a simple way, so I have to think about this. OK. Let's go to in, the next question. In the meantime, we can answer Oscar Solis' question. He's asking, how to relate the high nugget effect with the sampling protocol and after with the interpolation of grades in the case of gold silver deposits. Okay, the, the nugget, you have to identify if you have a severe <clears throat> nugget effect. So the, the nugget effect can be, uh, is not only gold, is not only precious metal, it can be uh, bonibdenum, copper, nickel, anything. You know, uh, that, is, uh, that is why you have to have a very good metal, uh, mineralogical study done on diamond core samples very early in a project. So you can predict if you are going to have severe nugget effect or severe in situ nugget effect you know, which are two different things. So this is uh, what we are talking about here is a fundamental sampling error. You know, it's a, it's a step number one in sampling to have this under control. So you cannot postpone that problem if you have evidence of minerals occurring as coarse grain, coarse calcopyrite, coarse molybdenite, coarse gold, coarse, uh, coarse uh, silver minerals, 
you you have to wake up right away and say the sampling protocols are going to be difficult and we need to optimize them right away. You cannot wait. Don't postpone that problem. Okay. Okay, Dr. Pitard. The next question that I have comes from Vanessa Andrade. She's asking, what are your recommendations on sampling a low-grade ore stockpile, which has been growing up for many years and now will be pre-processed on an ore sorter? Yeah. Well, that's, uh, you cannot sample the pile. That's a problem. So what's the uh, solution here? is to reclaim the pile, put the material on a conveyor belt, install a sampling system at the end of the conveyor belt that is loading trucks going to the plant, and that will tell you exactly what goes to the plant. Okay? But you cannot sample the stockpile. Thank you, Dr. Peter. The next question from, comes from someone anonymous, and the question is, in order to have a correct conciliation between mine and plant, does the sampling department must be managed by an external company or can the plant manage this department? No, it should be managed by yourself, by the company. You know, it's an internal affair. So you have to have, uh, within the company, you have to have your champions for, for sampling. They should be well trained. They can go to sampling courses, they can, uh, you know, read books. And uh, so in an operation, you should have a little task force. You should have a, a little group of people that are your, your champion on sampling issue. You should have a geologist, a metallurgist, a miner, maybe a statistician, maybe a chemist, a laboratory manager. You have those five people that know exactly all the subtleties about sampling. And uh, when you have an issue somewhere, may a reconciliation problem or buy a new system or uh, want to install a new system somewhere because you have an expansion, put those five people together and they will, they will determine what is the best thing to do. You need that internal task force, I call it. It's an internal task force that is a necessity in every operation. Excellent, Dr. Pitar, thank you. The next one comes from Danilo, Danilo Javier. His question is, do you think that bulk or sorting is a useful technique for sampling? Uh, not necessarily, it, um, it's two different things, you know, no, for sampling, what you have to do is to know the mineralogy of what you are looking for. And uh, again, I go, I go back to the inescapable stage of looking at a diamond core sample early in the project to find out what kind of animal you are dealing with, what is the distribution of those critical minerals that you are, are very valuable for you, how do they occur? And um, this is uh, all sorting. We don't, we will not answer that kind of questions. Thank you. The next one is also an anonymous question. It, it goes like this. Is there any recommendation for implementing a sampling plan in an alluvial gold ore? Uh, yeah, yeah, that is a, a, a good one. So in alluvial gold ore, so since the gold is distributed in a very erratic way, there is no structural distribution of gold that makes really sense. It's uh, gold has been uh, uh, concentrating in unpredict unpredictable area in pockets that you don't know where they are. 
uh, when the alluvials were taking place and things like that. So in that case, in that case, you have, you cannot take a sample and uh, send that to the sample preparation and tell, tell them to crush this stuff and split it and uh, send it for fire or say that you go nowhere with this. It's not going to work. So what you have to do here is to is to take a large sample. You know, you can have a, a mini pilot plant in the field for that for that alluvial deposit. You can have a baby Nelson concentrator, for example, a small one. Okay, so you're going to take uh, 100 kilo, send it to the Nelson concentrator get the concentrate to the lab and find out how much gold you have. And uh, you're going to repeat that all the time. You have to have in the field a tiny gold concentrator, maybe Nelson concentrator, that will be very valuable for you to, to verify what's going on you know, at all time as you try to process many tons to uh, a plant with alluvial gold. Excellent, Dr. Pitard. The next question comes from Gino Romero. His question is, what kind of sampler do you recommend for a cyanide flow? For cyanide, in a, so for example, in a CIL, CIP, CIP, CIL circuit, it's the same. It's, uh, you know, the, you are going to have a primary sampler with a secondary vesin, maybe a tertiary vesin. It's the same, but we have to, to make sure that we keep it clean, that uh, we keep people safe with cyanide when they go to either clean or collect samples. You know, there are uh, safety issues here with cyanide, of course. Uh, usually, people that work in a CIPCI CI circuit, they are well aware of those uh, safety issues, and you cannot have access uh, to the sampling station sometime for some, until they fix a few things to make sure that it is a safe thing to do. Okay, a safe environment. So safety comes first here. Excellent. The next question comes from Manuel Cherris. He's asking, what could you recommend to reduce a difference between 10 to 20% of a gold head calculated with plant sampling with the grade determined by geology in the ore that feed the milling plant and leaching tank. So here you, it's a very complex problem, okay? Obviously, because what you predict with uh, drilling before you mine that stuff is one thing. What you're going to see as you mine it may be completely different. So as you go, you have to adapt. And at the end, that stuff will go to the plant and then you will know the ultimate truth. So it's a iteration process. With geology, you can find out what you have, but you can go only so far because it's very expensive to drill. After that, when you mine, you know, you may have a better definition of what you have because you have a sample at very close intervals, either in open pit or underground, you can take sampling at very close interval and then have a much better picture of what the deposit is. Sometimes you have to re challenge your geological model because you realize that your previous geological model was not necessarily correct. So it's an iteration process. And then at the mine, after that, we have to do the best to send 
the good stuff to the plant and uh, get rid of the waste. That's another challenge, you know. And uh, frankly, ultimately, we will always, we will never know the truth until we process the material at the plant. So at the plant, it should be the ultimate stage where we know exactly what we were dealing with. So it's, uh, like I say, it's an iteration process. It's never perfect, you know, but as we go, we should be able to get better and better. Thank you, Dr. Pitar. The next one comes from Gerardo Miranda. Gerardo asks, what kind of sampling is the ideal for a stockpile? For a stockpile, you, the ideal sampling is to reclaim the stockpile, send it to a conveyor belt, sample it at the, uh, at the end of the conveyor belt, and then create a new, a new stockpile that you will send whenever you want at the plant. But you cannot drill a stockpile it will not work. Thank you. The next one comes from Loreto Romo. Loreto is asking, do you recommend cross path samplers for a tertiary, tertiary or rotary sampler? Uh, that it's a, a problem of personal preference. It can be done right both ways. I, for my, my personal uh, preference is for large flow or large tonnage, I prefer straight path, non-rotating, but straight path sampler. That's my preference. And then after that, when you do secondary sampling with much smaller flow or tertiary sampling, I rather have those nice little rotating vesin samplers. I, I like I like that kind of technology. But you could have a secondary straight path sampler as well. It can be done properly. Good, thank you. The next question comes from Angel Vera. Angel asks, what is the best sampling method for blasting? For blast all? Blasting, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it depends on the, if it's a, if it's a copper mine where the bench are a 15 meter mining bench with a diameter about uh, 30 centimeter diameter. So you, you will have on the ground a pile that is about two or three tons of material so in, in that case, you, you have to do a, a manual channel. You do a radial channel on opposite, two opposite side, and then all the way to the ground. And then uh, when you have your channel open, you, you, with a shovel, you take a cut, a radial cut on each side. So you will have four cuts one, two for, for this channel and two for the opposite channel. You will have four cuts, a total of about 20 kilo that you will take to the laboratory. That is for very large uh, bench copper mine, okay, for example. If it's a gold mine where the bench is maybe seven meters, the drilling is not so big. So on the ground, you don't have a whole bunch of material. You may have only uh, six, 700 kilo, I don't know. So in that case, you may put a radial bucket before you start drilling. And then when the operator enters the sub-drill, passador, when, you, when the driller enters the sub-drill, you remove the bucket. And that will be a, a fairly good sample, okay? Thank you, Dr. Pitard. The last question that we have for today, it comes from Jorge Ruiz. And Jorge wants to know, for the sampling of a silver truck and stacking, which is the best way to sample it? Does it exist a certified method? To, to sample trucks? Correct, a silver truck and stacking. 
the, is uh, the truck going to the plant or the truck going to the shipment of a concentrate? Maybe we can answer the both stages of the of the processing because he doesn't specify. Okay, if it's a truck going to the plant with a coarse material, you cannot sample the truck. It won't work. If it's a truck full of concentrate going to the port or going to from one client to the smelter, that kind of thing, you know, that is very common sampling. It can be done with uh, tubes, with augers, you know, but he has to represent, every time you take an increment, he has to represent the full thickness of the truck. You cannot take only part. If you drill halfway down the truck, it won't work. He has to, the, each time you take an increment, he has to go all the way to the bottom of the truck to take a full colon, that is one increment, and then do that again several times within the trucks until you have maybe five of them, you composite them, and that is a good sample, okay? But if it's coarse material like a runoff mine, cannot be done. Thank you, okay. Dr. Pitard. We are we are over now. I would like to hand over for Felipe to give us all the final comments. Yes, I would like to say thank you very much to everybody. And I would like to, to say thank you to Dr. Francis Peter and to Zacatecas Mining Cluster. And I would like to say to our Mexican customers that we have a, one reference. We have one reference uh, for a sampling system here in Mexico that is working very well. And, and they can uh, contact us and then uh, maybe we can uh, uh, arrange a meeting or or a visit with our, with our customer. And we will, we will uh, finish another uh, installation in four or five weeks for, for five sampling system. And it is, was a pleasure uh, this, uh, for this webinar with the Mexico business. I would like to, to say thank you very much too. And before we, uh, we leave, so I would like to ask to uh, Dr. Francis Peter, what is your message to our customer for all America with, with, with the question that you received in, during two days? So what is your uh, final message to our customers? Okay, it's uh, very good. What you are doing is very good. You know, what... Uh, the best thing you can do, I'm talking within Mexico, but you know, it would be great if we could do it in the US or in Canada or in many other parts in the world, you know, and has been done in, uh, in Chile, for example, or in, in Peru as well. Uh, some of your operation within Mexico should become benchmark the best you can get. So when you have those benchmark operation where you have been making a serious effort to install a good system, like you just mentioned, you may have one or two operation where this is taking place right now. So they become the, main, the benchmark, in other words, the model for everybody else. And that is very good because you can have uh, visitors that, uh, you know, they can look at that stuff and uh, it gives them a good incentive to say, oh, you know, we didn't think about this, we didn't think about that. Now we understand why we have problems. So it's, it's, it's critically important for an organization like you, you have to create those benchmark models, okay? It's, uh, it's a wonderful thing to do. 
very much. Thank you very much for everybody and have a, a good day. Okay. So.